me down real quick. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's session of the Anthropology Club. In today's meeting, we're going to be talking about Japanese culture and how it relates to the rest of the world and its development from, you know, things like anime, music, architecture, so on and so forth. Um, with us here today is, you know, our lovely president, Esther Land. Hello. Uh, hello. And her brother is here today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello. I am Joshua, and I'm Esther's brother, and I will be helping out here with Japanese culture, because apparently I know a lot about it. So. Yes, yes, yes. He's our, he's our local Japanese um, specialist. He knows everything, the ins and outs of Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and of course, me, Orlando, Vice President of Anthropology Club. All right. So, let's get started then. Who wants to start us off? Um, okay. <laughs> Japanese culture. So, the main thing in Japan that has been booming over to Western culture as it affects us is their entertainment, which is anime and manga, which is their most common, you know, animation. And... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk about animation. Okay, animation. You know, what are the, the main categories of Japanese culture and how do they compare to Western culture and the, the genres there? Well, uh, recently in Japan, there has been a boom in horror anime mm. and there's a lot of, you know, thriller type scenarios, I guess, that are coming up. Yeah, I've seen that. And it's, I think it's really interesting because, you know, although American has been like horror was prevalent, but that was like 1980s and 90s was like the most, or not 90s, it was probably like 2000s, right? Mm, what came about? Oh. Yeah, when exactly. that had like Jaws and all of those, you know, <laughs> giant, I'm super bad at this, so sorry about that. When you <laughs> had those giant booms, and I think to some extent, it might be bringing around like the normality of horror because yeah. although you know in american culture we've had horror for a while and it's been like booming at one point it's never been like you know grammy nominated it's never been the best mm -hmm. not so, like yeah the yeah. best it's always been like a, you know a close second at most yeah i mean if you if you remember there was a time when clowns came about and the whole world was or not the whole world i meant all of America was terrified of clowns because of, I think it was the movie It, right? Mm hmm Yeah. Is that it? Yeah, and I think that was the most recent uh, horror movie in the Western culture, mm -hmm. which I don't know if that was at around the same time that Japanese culture started getting more interested in horror or not. Do you think that was tied somehow? So, uh, I just want to weigh in real quickly. Um, I don't know if necessarily it was like it had to do with their their interest in horror, but I think what's interesting about the their approach is that since it's centered around anime, is that they can do certain things that essentially the uh, contemporary horror movies in the Western world can't. You know, mm. is that like there's a couple of um, mangas that were being made into movies. I forgot what it was this one, but um, it has to do with the animation and how how the perspective that they they give and they're able to kind of be more subtle about their horror so it's more surprising rather and i think that's kind of interesting mm -hmm. was that a death note no it was, no, it was not death <laughs> oh, okay yeah. I'm trying to remember yeah. i don't no, we know what you've been watching <laughs> <laughs> mm, but i mean talking on the topic of of anime i think it's interesting how it came about um, and I, I saw a really interesting take on this. Um, basically, how it's interesting how anime um, at first in, Jap in Japan was kind of centered around for children. You know, man manga was centered for children, but it, it came about kind of. I think it was Gundam, and and which one was it? Yum and Yamoto. I think those were two of the most more popular animes that came about. That kind of first introduced like adult themes in anime, and it brought about kind of this otaku culture. And an interesting take that they, they made about it was essentially say that 
this anime kind of touched on a different perspective in sort of drama, where basically because Japan had just, you know, had gone through World War II, and they were basically the losing side, in this anime, we weren't looking at it from this glorified, oh, we're superior, oh, we're the winners, but we were looking at it from the perspective of people going through failure, of people essentially being the losing side and essentially going through these these thrillers and this drama that essentially was from a different perspective and that kind of brought about this this very this this fair interest in anime and basically made it more adult centered than than in comparison to the western culture where you had like cartoons and animation like that so i thought that was yeah. pretty interesting yeah yeah that was i think i think what you're talking about is the original like manga series that was first created in, you know, Japan. And apparently it was very, very impactful and it changed a lot of, you know, people's lives during World War II. But I think it was, I think it's interesting how World War II, you know, kind of shaped Japan for such a long period afterwards. Because before World War II, from, you know, from what you hear, they were very, you know, like, we are superior and we're, you know, like this amazing but now they're very like, they're not, they, they like, they kind of, they don't have, they still have like a pride around them and they have an honor, which is like, you know, very cool about it, mm. but they have this like, you know, relaxing. They're like, they always strive to become the best. And so I think it's a cool aspect. Mm. Uh, well, what was well, interesting well, about like the, I'm sorry, were you, did I interrupt you? Oh, no, 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 go, no go. Okay. So the interesting thing about World War II and kind of like the aftermath of that for Japan was like they kind of went through this what they called hyper urbanization where basically, you know, they were trying to rebuild and they were trying new things. But after that, they kind of went through this economic shift, uh, depression, basically. And as they kind of went through this period where they were coming up from that and this innovation was just kind of the top priority for them. Mm -hmm. And from that period, we kind of saw things like the Walkman. Um, you know, Sony and like that innovation. And we saw things like the anime kind of come about from that. And what people don't realize that how much of an impact that's had like on, on the consumer's culture is it's not only that the, those inventions came about, but rather a device, this idea of like otaku essentially being so obsessed with some kind of some kind of topic, like for, for them, it's anime or rather for us, it can be comic books. It's just having a, a culture, like it's it shifted the culture in a direction where it wasn't just about, oh, you're a geek if you like this. No, now it's po now it's okay to be kind of a geek or a nerd and, and be in so in so enthralled into these kinds of cultures that don't exist, rather or this fantasy, kind of like anime, like comic books and all those kinds of kinds of uh, cultures. And it's interesting how that came about from Japanese culture because it it's kind of like they were ahead of their time, you know. Um, some people even went as far as to say if they'd never invented the Walkman, we wouldn't even have the iPhone today, which I thought was pretty interesting. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's true. You do see a lot of Japanese culture, even in the Western uh, hemisphere. And there are, you know, manga clubs, anime clubs, even in Richland College, where we're based. Uh, and that's completely normal and you know I actually took a Japanese class about a year ago mm. more than half the people were there because they loved animes and mangas <laughs> so it's something that's you know definitely changing western culture um throughout all of this media yeah and like you're saying yeah, yeah it's more normalized yeah mm -hmm. And it's it's just interesting to see how, you know, when you think about it, we don't really, when we think about like Japanese culture, we just think very vaguely of like, oh, just anime and gaming and things like that. But we don't really consider like how interesting thing I kind of fix consumer culture and kind of how we see our things. And I thought that's what was most interesting. But another really interesting thing I kind of fix, uh, did upon my research was this idea of Wabi Sabi. Where basically, like a lot of their architecture is centered around basically integrating like modern, contemporary um, infrastructure, and but then also maintaining the the traditional side of it. Like if you look in America, a lot of our older older buildings, we tend to just knock them down. We don't really think about it, and it's because our infrastructure is just centered around having a purpose. It's just centered around um, doing something for us, providing something for us. 
But for the Japanese culture, it seems to be much more pur purposeful in the meaning of it. And so you see a lot of their old architecture kind of mixed in with contemporary architecture. And it's very interesting how for them, it's important to preserve this. It's important mm -hmm. to have it. And it comes from this idea of wabi-sabi. Um, I'm not sure if you guys are all, at all familiar with that. Um, not as familiar as you, it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's really cool is like it means like essentially the beauty in in the the fading away. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of like finding the beauty in things that are older, things that have rust, things that have like time, that have that, that's part of it that's wavered away. It's like it's just this philosophy, I guess you could say, of looking at things that might at first seem to be old or seem to have faded away and finding the beauty inside of it. Mm -hmm. That's that's very interesting to me. And that's the, you see it a lot in their architecture. You see it a lot in their their culture in terms of like their tea ceremonies. Um, oh. Yeah, and that's something that I thought was pretty interesting as well. But yeah, here, I'll let you guys go. I feel like I'm just <laughs> talking oh, to you. No. Um, yeah. Anything that you have to say, Joshi? I don't know. Not yet. thinking. Not yet. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, not yet. Okay. Um, well, you know, actually, I was listening to a lecture recently on Japan, and uh, the most recent time that... Oh, and I can't remember who it was that was saying it, but they were doing a speech right after they wanted to uh, integrate themselves into the global community rather than being isolated. And they were saying, you know, oh, we've been isolated for so, so many years and like since ancient times and stuff. And it was interesting because the lecturer said that they weren't actually isolated from the rest of the world for, you know, all of ancient Jap uh, Japanese history. Mm -hmm. Instead, there were three times that they were isolated. But then after that, you know, after each time, they became more globalized. Mm -hmm. And one of the times that they were isolated was when they were trying to protect themselves from the Chinese dynasty. And I can't remember which dynasty it was. I keep thinking it's Tang Dynasty, but I, I must be wrong about that. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, I think I know who you're talking about. It was a general, right? Uh, was it a general? There was a Japanese general who stated something along those lines right, right before World War II. Oh, it, yeah. it was around World War II that he was mm -hmm. saying that. And they made a movie off of it, too. It was, <laughs> it was very cool. Mm -hmm. And how yeah. their isolation periods went. All that to say, you know, Japanese culture has been... Uh, really integrated or it came from a lot of Chinese culture mm. and you know you see a lot of similarities between the two but then whenever you compare them there's a lot of differences for example you know the Japanese alphabet they have their own phonetic system but then they also use kanji which are borrowed from mm. the Chinese characters mm. right yeah um, so they have very distinct uh, their own distinct culture, but then it's also, like you were saying, um, I forgot what word you used, but preserving of the past mm -hmm. and yet proceeding with the future. Yeah, and I think speaking on their language, like it's funny, they have like what, four writing systems? And that's insane. And I saw like a little fact chart of how long it takes people to learn their language. In comparison to others, like it's, it literally says 2,200 hours minimum is needed to learn Japanese, which I thought was pretty insane. <laughs> I don't know if I have 2,200 hours. <laughs> 2,200 hours. I think, I think they're based on, off of, yeah, so like for Americans to learn Japanese, it's like super long time. But if, I think it's for Koreans to Japanese, it's like, 800 hours or something, but for Chinese to Japanese, it's like, you know, something like 600 hours or mm -hmm. something like that. But there, but yeah, it's still very different, but yeah, you know, similar. Yeah, right. that's crazy to me. Mm -hmm. 
But um, I also have like a, a couple of other quick little facts. It's interesting. Like uh, yearly, they get about fifteen hundred earthquakes, which I was like, yeah, that sucks. Mm-hmm. And they have a hundred and ten active volcanoes. That's mm-hmm. that's something. It's, and it's interesting to see how how small and how I guess intimate you could say their cities are in comparison to other cities. Like I remember seeing a video of someone just walking around Japan. And they'd have like a little room for vending machines where it's literally like it's body space where you're just walking in and it's just you that can fit in there. So Mm -hmm. it's it's interesting to think about that. Yeah. Uh, Another cool thing is that they we get a lot of American words that I forgot (laughs) what it was. Was it like uh, karaoke? Mm -hmm. You know, so I I forgot (laughs) what it was. Was it? Um. What was the English word that came from it? Karaoke. Um, Oof. I can't remember it. Ugh, I feel annoyed. It is karaoke, though. No, no, no. They're, karaoke is what we got from them. So mm-hmm. they, we told them a word, and they changed it to karaoke, and mm. they gave it back. Oh, time. really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. And there's a few other words like that now, and I thought it was really cool uh-huh. how they change words and just throw it back to us and... <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. Cool. yeah. I knew I know the word for McDonald's in Japanese. <laughs> it's <laughs> Masu Donarudo. So, I like. Do you it. ever oh, make the good Japan? <laughs> the adaptability. I think that's I think that's a great way to put Japanese. They're very uh-huh. adaptable. Like languages will come in and they'll all change them to like Japanese. And now all these weird things are now like Japanese or whatever, where they have words for them. And so I think it's very cool with Japanese culture. Yeah, the Japanese very, language adopts yeah. foreign words mm-hmm. so often. That's too, That's so true. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's, uh, it's interesting how you say their, like their adaptability, I think, because if you really think about it, and we don't really see other cultures the way we see J- Japanese culture. You know, we don't really take too much from other countries like maybe the UK or Italy. Like they own, they all have their own subculture, but they don't seem to have the same influence as Japan. And I think mm-hmm. it's for the reason that you said it's kind of like their adaptability in the way that they kind of have this problem solving, or rather this this new way of looking at things that's so interesting to everybody else. I mean, take their food for instance. It's th- like their food; they don't really center their whole purpose of food like around taste. It's also around aesthetics and how it looks. And that's why you see, like, in animes and their food, it looks so tasty and it looks so, like, aesthetics and how it looks thing as well. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, have we gotten to that point? We ran out of everything. <laughs> another, another little one. Mm-hmm. Um honor their society is very very based around honor like you know they never want to shame their family and they're willing to do a lot to to preserve that that pride that they have and they're willing to do a lot to, mm-hmm. so that's another cool aspect you know to build off of. yeah that's true it's true the difference between you know what we value versus what they value and if you go to america their most prized uh, virtue is honor, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And if you go to America, then I would say that the most prized virtue isn't even a virtue, it's money, I think. Greed. Greed, <laughs> yes. You see so much of that in America, and it's it's almost like it's been put on a pedestal and I, idolized, you know. Technically speaking, honor isn't, it usually comes with pride. Hmm? But yeah. What do you mean? Pride is usually, well, in America, pride is usually seen as like, you know, one of the seven deadly sins or something along those lines. And so it's interesting how what we deem greed to be, you know, tolerable. And they, not quite pride, but they allow a certain form of it. Honor in the, you're saying pride in the form of honor. Yeah, pride in the form I of honor. I see. Which, you know, I would argue that it's actually not you know necessarily bad until it gets too excessive you know mm-hmm. like most things though 
So it's almost like different cultures have um, a tendency to go towards one of the, you know, seven deadly sins, as they call it. So that's an interesting point. We'll have to talk more about that whenever we talk about the next country. <laughs> So I think the to talk more about that whenever we what you guys were saying. Um, I mean, I agree to the whole like uh, to honor and like how it's sur surrounded in their culture. But if you kind of look at it, I think uh, the res resurgence of otaku is kind of like counteracting that. Or you having a lot of consumer kind of culture in there in in their life. Like more people are getting more interested in like buying things and having things and essentially just surrounding their entire life around consumerism, which is kind of the counter to, to what you guys were saying about honor. And it's kind of, there's this kind of this ideal in Japan where people kind of look down on them and they, they like, oh, like, you know, why do you care about this so much, so on and so forth. But it seems to be more normalized now. It seems to be regular. And so it feels like that's sort of our, our influence on them is like our consumerist uh, nature is kind of influencing them in a way where basically that's kind of changing for them. And so that, I don't know if necessarily that's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, are we sure that they're creating all of these consumerist products to use them themselves? Or, you know, so, are we, are they creating them for the sake of bringing honor to their country? Because I've heard that, you know, the Japanese culture, you, create something and you do your part to make sure that your country is recognized and to help grow your country. And it's not so much uh, the actual product as it is the impact on the world. So, so I agree with you on that. Like going back to the whole idea of like Wabi Sabi is basically, you know, preserving that that ideal and that culture. And you're right. And like that seems that still seems to be their focus. Um, but I take their anime, for instance. If you look at a, a lot of their anime, you know, not all of it is, you know, up to standard to anime. You know, not all of them. You know, it's not all like super deep or philosophical. It's not all sort of centered around ideology. It's more centered around consumerism. It's more like, oh, okay, here's these voluptuous looking anime characters that's going to attract male audiences. Uh, you, know, you have things like that that are kind of coming up from this mm -hmm. subculture, which once again, you know, I don't know if necessarily that's a good or bad thing. Yeah, I definitely get what you're saying, how there's this, you know, it, like very, it's, it was a minority, like very small a while ago, but it's, it's growing and it's developing and it might, you know, overtake Japanese culture as we know it, mm -hmm. or it may, you know, die out as like a fashion or a, uh, a fad, a fad mm -hmm. yeah, as they call it. Exactly. Yeah, but I mean, I think regardless of that, you're, you guys were right, though, is like what has come from it, the product of this is still something that's pretty amazing in that we're all kind of benefiting from it in a sense. And I think there was something funny that, that this guy said. He was like, well, I think everybody in the world in this way is kind of Japanese. We're all sort of Japanese because of how it's influenced us and how it's touched us in some kind of way. Like, it doesn't even matter if you don't watch anime or if you don't like these things. If if you like, if you're a nerd for something or if you have an iPhone, you're in a sense, you're kind of Japanese. And I, and I thought that was pretty interesting how he said that. But hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. It's an interesting statement. Yeah. It's a bit controversial, <laughs> but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> controversial. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it is. That's true that Japan has really extended its reach into a lot of the world and a lot of daily life. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it Much, comes from almost complementary to oh, I was gonna say, uh, they've kind of extended in a way that's almost complementary to the Chinese and how China has extended, you know, they've produced a lot of things and manufactured more things and you'll see toys that say made from China on them. Mm -hmm. And then Japan is over here coming in uh, to this, yeah, to this industry that we've been talking about, more entertainment mm. and uh, science and technology. And they've contributed a lot through that. But, yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. And I think it goes back to the whole idea of like facing problems head on kind of before the rest of the world, I guess you could say. It's like, it's what, the, it's what I meant by like hyper urbanization. Um, they're also going through something that we're going to be going through essentially where um, we're, they're going to be having a lot more older people than, than younger people. And now, I think now in the time period, that's sort of a problem that they're going to have to face. And that's something we're going to have to face as well in the near future where it's kind of already the case, but a lot more prominent. So it's kind of going to be interesting to see how they deal with having like a, a, a huge population of elders and kind of how they how they go about in their healthcare system and not only that but like how they deal with it as a problem as a whole and i feel like maybe in the future we might be seeing integrations of that in our own society and so that'd be you know that's something <laughs> i think another thing is is that I, oh my goodness wow i just now realized it but we're like two steps behind japan in a lot of senses because uh I think it was it was a while back, you know, it was like 40 years or something. But Japan had a massive um, unemployed, I think, yeah, unemployed workforce. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they built this program to, you know, basically they paid businesses to hire people and to give them like skill sets and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then their unemployment just dropped. It was amazing and something. And like now Great. almost everybody that wants a job can get a job. And in America, with, you know, the coronavirus, now we have a skyrocketing unemployment rate. But, Mm. I mean, if we, you know, look at what they did, we might be able to avoid a lot of the giant problems that come from that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. And that's exactly, like, what we've seen for the most part. Um, It's just kind of uh, having that influence from them because of, like, the way they decided to spearhead things. And, um, you know, I'm just interested to see how how they're going to influence us more or if in turn what how that will change us you know i guess you could say um Mm -hmm. yeah definitely stuff to look forward to in the future (laughs) yep so uh does anybody have anything that they want to say before we end then Um, I guess I should say something. Um, I would say kind of a message to Americans is in terms, I guess, of Japan is like we should be more open minded to newer ideas and sort of how we go about adopting their culture, so on and so forth, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, for sure. Joshi, any last thoughts? Um, no. Not- not anything that hasn't been said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the Richland Anthropology Club signing off. All statements and all opinions are completely our own and do not belong to anybody else. Actually, I take that back. They all belong to Orlando. So. No, they're all Esters. Nah. They're <laughs> Especially not. the part where she said that we're all Japanese. That's, that's her specifically. Mm-hmm. Sure, whatever. <laughs> anyway, have a nice All day. Right. Goodbye. Okay.